Hi everyone, welcome back to Five Code Shakespeare Hamlet. This is my first video in the Hamlet series and today we're going to tackle theme. There are many themes in this strange and wonderful play, so stay tuned. Okay, a little bit of background first. The play is set in Denmark in the late Middle Ages. Prince Hamlet, it's based on a true, true character, by the way. There was a Prince Hamlet, and he is away in Wittenberg. While he is away, he hears news that his father, King Hamlet, has died, and his mother, Gertrude, has married Claudius, who happens to be the dead king's brother. So, family weirdness, lots of family weirdness. Hamlet returns to Denmark for one wedding and a funeral, and the play opens with him trying to deal with this nonsense. Okay, the first important theme is the hero's quest, the hero's journey in Wasteland theme. This is a classic theme. You know it somehow. You know it. Even if you don't know you know it, you know it because you've seen it a thousand times. It, it begins in the womb. The hero is in the womb. The hero is in the known realm. They're innocent. They're little babies. They don't know what they're doing. The Hagrid comes. That's J.K. Rowling's beautiful metaphor about the, the calling. It's that moment when the hero is called out onto the adventure. You're not allowed to stay in the womb forever. You got to get out there and you got to tackle the dark forest. In the dark forest, it, you learn who you are. You learn what your powers are. It's the realm of teenhood. It's the, the realm of young adulthood. It is the unknown. It's where the challenges are. At Once you know who you are and you become who you are, you have to slay the dragon. There's two different kinds of dragons that we're going to talk about. The psychological dragon, the, 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 the tyrant that's holding you back personally, the things maybe inside you. And then there's a social dragon, which is, which is the, 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 the creature or whatever forces there are that are that are preventing a society from from fulfilling its potential once you slay that dragon you've got power you are who you are you've 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 graduated from medical school or whatever you're a doctor you're a teacher you're 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 a bricklayer whatever skills you have now you return to the world and you give those skills the boon that benefit you return it to the world now go watch the hobbit go watch lord of the of the rings go watch anything and you'll see a version of this now let's apply it to hamlet First of all, I'm not going to worry about spoilers. Um, I'm assuming that you know the story. Read it yourself or watch a good movie, and I'm going to get right into the into the guts of it. Um, as I've kind of hinted at, Denmark is a wasteland. Something's rotten in, in, in the state of Denmark. That's actually a quote from the play at the beginning of the play. Shakespeare very, very specifically establishes Denmark as a wasteland. Um, think of, again... Think of the Hobbit. Think of any. Think of the Harry Potter series when Voldemort rises up, his forces rise up, and creates a wasteland. What happens when that happens? Well, you get the calling of the hero. The hero is called upon to sacrifice him or herself to um, heal that wasteland, um, and that's 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 what we get in Denmark. Hamlet, Prince Hamlet, is called upon to avenge the murder of his father. The father's ghost comes back, even more terrifying, and says, "Remember me." get revenge now that's all well and good if you are a capable hero if you are the worthy hero y you can rise to that challenge and you can you can you can put your powers to the test and save save humanity and save yourself hamlet's a different creature hamlet's an example of the failed of the failed hero he he doesn't have he doesn't have in him the the worthy characters that 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 a real hero hero would have and he and he's up against forces that are too great for him you see, and so it's partly his fault and partly not his fault. The forces are just way too great. Um, part of that, that, that the, 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 the hero's purpose in, in healing the wasteland is to find out who they are by conquering that tyrant dragon, both the psychological and the social. We find who we are, um, we find our authentic self, um, we free the powers that are that are, have been born in us but are still trapped in us because we're not ready for them yet we're still kids okay and then once you get over that then yeah they're out there and you can you can do great things by following the Hagrid by following your own Hagrid you find your authentic self and that's what vitalizes the world there's a beautiful quote by Joseph Campbell and he said he said somewhere I can't remember where he said a vital spirit vitalizes if you are if you have managed to become who you are you're satisfied with yourself whatever level of society you might not be you know an nba star but you're doing something good and you're proud of yourself for that that radiates to the whole world and it it it, it vitalizes everybody around you hamlet he's not that kind of hero he 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 tries he tries but he's he's the he's what we would call the failed hero and another way to think of the failed hero is the the um the wrong man for the job, the wrong person for this particular job. He's called upon to do something that he's not 
prepared. He's not able to do um, because of, of, of innate qualities. Um, I just want to point out that this is an archetypical experience. Um, do read Joseph Campbell's Heroes, Hero with a Thousand Faces. It's absolutely brilliant and very, very important. It's based on Carl Jung's theory of uh, the collective unconscious and archetypes and stuff. It's fascinating and applies to your own life. It's, it's, it's a biological archetype. We can't escape it. And that's why it gets told again and again and again. The interesting thing about Hamlet is that it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a sidelong take on this this archetype because as i said he is the failed hero uh let's talk a little bit more about the psychological aspect of this the psychological wasteland hamlet is living an inauthentic life he's asked to do things that he doesn't want to do and he doesn't have the courage maybe uh to say no uh his mother and father his new father his his uncle asked him don't go tell him not to go back to germany to continue his studies so he says yeah okay i won't do you see what happened he didn't follow his own hagrid he followed somebody else's and he ends up in this in this quagmire. His self is defeated. In a true hero's story, a victorious hero will find him or herself. As I've mentioned, something rotten in the state of Denmark. The tyrant steals and hoards society's energies and its powers. The tyrant must be slain to free these powers and restore life and vitality. That's what Hamlet's called upon to do. And as you know, because you've watched the movie, he's not up to the task. Connected to the great, uh, connected to the hero's quest and wasteland theme is the great chain of being. And the, you, your teachers might have taught you this in school. It's really a history lesson, actually. The, the the cosmology of the Elizabethans, the Shakespeare, the Shakespeare, people in Shakespearean times, the 1600s approximately, uh, uh, late 1500s. They understood the universe in a particular way. We understand the universe as starting from the Big Bang and everything emanates outward from that. That's our cosmology. The Elizabethan cosmology was what we call today the great chain of being. At the top, there was God. Directly under that was the monarch. And the monarch was a representation of God on earth. They were a conduit to God's grace. Underneath the monarch were the other levels of society, right from the nobles down to the serfs and everything else, right down to, to the animals, the trees, and then the rocks at the bottom. It's an order. It's, it's a pretty, it's a decent, you know, it, it makes you feel good when you, you know your place, you know that that this is where you are. It, it's, it's a pretty stable place to be psychologically, do you see? What happens in a lot of Shakespearean plays is that he toys with the idea of, he needs, a, he needs a wasteland. He needs to create a wasteland. So one way to do that is to destroy that order, destroy that cosmology, wreck the great chain of being. And in Shakespeare, that happens when you kill the king or the queen. Did any queens die in Shakespeare? When you kill the king, you, you, you sever that link to grace, to God's grace, and all the demons, all the, 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 all the evil spirits and bats and wolves and monsters, you know, start crawling the earth. You see it in Macbeth, and you see it again in um, Julius Caesar, and we see it here in Hamlet for sure. Killing a monarch was a violation of nature and of the order of the universe. It cuts off society from access to goodness and God. It creates that wasteland. It causes weird, unnatural disturbances in nature. They, did, they believed it. This was part of their belief system. And so Shakespeare knew that when, his, when, when he was writing the play. Um, just, a, just a final final note. I already talked about this, but I just want to prove it to you. So the failed, unworthy, tragic hero. It's the wrong person for the job. That's, that's Hamlet. It is a wasteland. The great chain of being has been disrupted. It is a wasteland. The hero is called upon to heal it. Hamlet's not up for it. He says, he says so right at the beginning. He says, oh, cursed spite that ever I was born to set it right. There you go. There's evidence right there. He says it. He says, I'm not up for this. Why did they ask me to, to, to fix this problem? I can't do it. Hamlet's flaws are too great. His personality is inadequate to overcome the challenges that are posed by the dragons. Now, if you don't want to talk about the wasteland theme as the wasteland theme, you can just talk about parental interference because it's, it's, it's a major, major theme in this whole play. In this variation on the wasteland theme, the parents are the tyrant dragons. And you see that a lot in young adult fiction. If you've read a lot of young adult fiction or seen a lot of movies, uh, the parents very often are. If they're not nurturing and supportive, then they are the tyrants. And they're the things, they're the forces that are preventing the youth from achieving selfhood. In this play, we see it in the classic consuming mother archetype, the mother or the father. The, the mother tends to be more manipulative psychologically. The father can just be brutish, like, like, like Juliet's father, just brutish and cruel and say, you do this or you're out kind of thing. But the mother tends to be more manipulative, emotionally manipulative, and that's the Oedipal mother. The Oedipal mother is the mother that wants to 
consume the sun for her own purposes. Stay with me, stay with me. She transfers some erotic love from the, the healthy love object, which would be the husband, onto the son, very often because it's a single mother or something like that, and, and they, they don't have a healthy relationship with an adult man, so they project those desires and needs, they're very deep needs, onto the poor boy. Um, the Joker is like this. The Joker, there, there's a hint of that in the Joker. Not so much a hint, it's, it's quite clear, but it's there in the Joker. Um, it's very, very sad. Hamlet's a victim of this, and Shakespeare built it in there very, very clearly. Uh, there's a really grotesque scene in the mother's bedroom uh, where Hamlet obsessed. He, he's got a, he's got a, he's sexually repressed as well, which we'll talk about later, and that that plays into it. Um, the father, right from the beginning, the father comes in and says, "Son, you shall do this. Your whole life will be put on hold, and you will be in my service until the task is complete." That's what the dead father says. He comes from beyond the grave to say that. Now, there you go. If you've got a bully father, let's just hope that he, he, they, that he can't get to you from beyond the grave because poor old Hamlet is dealing with, with some really serious stuff. Um, again, a variation on the wasteland, a variation on meddling is the bet betrayal of trust. Uh, there's no one. This is part of what I said about uh, uh, Hamlet fails because of personal flaws. Yes, true. However, He's up against obstacles that you and I, hopefully, uh, could not even understand. So we have to have sympathy for him. We can call out his, his faults and say, yeah, you, you, you weren't quite this kind of guy. But at the same time, there's nobody. There's absolutely nobody that he can trust in all of, of Denmark except one guy uh, whose name is Horatio, which we'll talk about later. One friend among them all. He can't trust his mother, Gertrude. He certainly can't trust his murderous uncle, Claudius, who smiles. He's the smiling villain that smiles in his face and says that I love you like a son, um, but plots to murder him, by the way. He can't trust his boys. His bros, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, are hired by Claudius to spy on him. And he, and, he, and he understands that. And of course, Polonius is a meddling fool, as you'll see. And Ophelia, poor Ophelia, is bullied by her father and she betrays Hamlet. That's a complicated thing and it's not totally Ophelia's fault, but, but she, she, she kind of does. She returns her, her uh, Hamlet's letters. Anyway, so there we are. Meddling, parental interference, a variation on the wasteland theme. Pay attention to it. It's great. When writers land on a theme to explore in a work of fiction, what they're very often doing is asking a question. And one of the grand old questions that gets asked again and again is, is how much... How much do we owe to the, to the development of the self and how much do we owe to society and, and, and by extension to our parents or to our parents and by extension to society? Conflicted loyalties, duty, the question of duty. It's, it's a huge, huge question. And Shakespeare asks it in a lot of his plays. Um, and, and the answer is never satisfactory because it's one of these you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't um, um, questions. What does, what does Juliet do? She sides with the self. She decides definitively with the self. She says, screw my family. She's, I'm going all out for the development of myself. She devotes herself to Romeo, which is her true love, which is a true expression of herself. And she says, whatever happens, that's what I'm going to do. I, I, I will totally ignore society. Now, is that selfish? What happens to her? She dies. I don't know. The duty to the self versus duty to society, the family, and the friends. In, in this case, it's very real. Hamlet is the prince, and he has princely responsibilities. You hear this today um, a lot with the British royal family, for example. You know, they want, should they follow their own heart? Prince, you know, Harry, you know, left the royal family for his love, supposedly, or I guess. I don't follow it that, that closely, but there is, a, there is a gossipy kind of modern version of that. Well, Hamlet, Hamlet was living that as well. He couldn't, he couldn't politically marry Ophelia. He was basically forbidden, and that causes a lot of tension. It's very subtle underlying tension, but it's there, and we'll see it. Uh, Ophelia, unlike Juliet, she ain't no Juliet. Trust me. Go watch Romeo and Juliet deeply and look at how hero-worthy Juliet is. Ophelia is the opposite. Romeo equally is hero worthy and he's he's the exact opposite of Hamlet. Romeo and Juliet are are the, are the successful heroes. Um, they die because of, of of their own youthful stupidity but but anyway that's 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 another video. Go watch my video on Romeo and Juliet. It's pretty good. Um, anyway, so Juliet fails as the hero. She obeys society, she betrays herself and she betrays Hamlet. 
Um, how much does Hamlet owe to his mother and to his father? I already mentioned uh, at the beginning, uh, he says, okay, I won't go and continue my studies. And what are studies? Studies are the development of the self. He says, I won't do that. I'll stay here and I'll be your good little boy, mom and new dad, whom I'm very suspicious of and don't really like all that much. Okay, so grand, grand, grand question. Uh, look at it. Look at it in the other works that you've studied. Look at it in your own life and uh, see if you can find a good answer because there ain't none except on a case-by-case -case basis. Revenge. You know what a genre is? A genre play, a genre movie, a genre of work of fiction or something like that? Um, they kind of get a bad rap because they tend to be formulaic. And yeah, they are formulaic. And they're formulaic for a reason because it's a damn good formula. The Hero's Quest you can almost consider a genre, although you know, the genre would be more like the sci-fi hero's quest or the cowboy hero's quest or the, the knight in shining armor hero's quest. That would be the genre, you know, the fantasy or whatever it is. But you, you know what I'm saying. They, they're, they're, they are these formulas that get played out again and again and again. Um, I don't disparage them. Uh, I've been talking about the hero's quest my whole life and I never get tired of seeing it. Uh, and what I marvel at is, oh, wow, look at how well this new movie does it. Look at how well Shakespeare does it here. Look how, how varied it is. Shakespeare, as I said already, that, that, the, the, that the Hero's Quest uh, uh, a version that Shakespeare does is incredibly complex and, and, and quite novel. Well, this is a genre play. Uh, it's a revenge play. It's a revenge play. Um, you've seen a thousand revenge plots, right? At the very beginning, there's an, there, there's an initiating incident that, that causes the hero to be called out on the adventure, and the adventure is to get revenge for whatever. Uh, it's, a very masculine, um, it's a very masculine genre. Uh, because men like like to like to feel worthy. Men like to to do things to set the world right. We we do. We really really do. It's I think it's hardwired into us through evolution, and it's and it's glorious. It's absolutely glorious. If something's not right, fix it. And uh, and it, there's a lot of macho ness, you know, in 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 a lot of these movies about men going out and 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 doing things right. But it, it's it's who we are. That's an exaggerated version of what we want to do every day. Um, it's and I, I find it kind of tender and kind of nice and and yeah and, and unavoidable. So it should be celebrated. Um, so this this very much is Hamlet is very much a revenge uh, um, genre and it's been it's been it's been derided somewhat because of that. It's it's been belittled because of that, as if it's a lesser uh, creature because it's 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 so predictable. Well, Shakespeare throws in a lot of uh, a lot of twists. If it's a revenge plot, there are well-known expectations. The hero is supposed to have that call, and then he's supposed to go through a bunch of trials and find his target and take out the target and return to society with the boons, with the benefits. You know, the order is reestablished. Those are the expectations. But, but Shakespeare throws this twist in there um, right at the beginning, three times. Is it three, three, or four, three or four times in the play? Hamlet is giving, it's, it's, he's, the, the, the object of revenge is given up to Hamlet, to the hero, right at the beginning or near the beginning, in the middle, and says, here you go, here he is, kill him, and then it's done, the movie's done, we can all go home. Shakespeare does that, but, but Shakespeare being the great psychologist that he was, he has the hero given that target, and, and, and for psychological reasons he can't, or, or other reasons, not just psychological, but yeah, well, anyway, we'll, we'll talk about it. It's fascinating, fascinating variation on the, on, the, on the revenge plot. And another variation is that not only do we have the one simple, you know, some evil guy kills a guy's wife and the guy goes out to get revenge, one plot, one revenge plot, okay? Uh-uh, Shakespeare gives us three. Hamlet, Laertes, and Fortinbras at the highest political level. Fortinbras, we'll talk about him when we get into the politics of the plot in my next videos. Laertes is a, is a character foil for Hamlet, and they both have a parallel revenge plots to, uh, to, to, to follow through, and all of them involve fathers. Now, isn't that interesting? So, yeah, sure, it's a genre. Who cares? It's a genre handled by a genius. Thought versus action is another grand old theme. It's absolutely unavoidable. Like self versus society, it's a conflict that all of us have to wrestle with to some degree at some point in our lives. The same thing with thought versus action. If you're an adolescent, if you're a teenager sitting in class, you see the love object sitting on the other side of the room. If you're a guy, it's a cute girl that you'd love to ask out, there's the thought. And you think about her constantly. Girls, same thing, thinking about that cute guy, you think about them constantly. Now. The gap between those thoughts that, are, that, can, that can just, you know, possess you like a mad person. 
the gap between those thoughts and actually walking across the room and saying, hey, you want to go for a coffee? It's, it's a huge, huge gap. And Shakespeare knows that because he's a human being and he experiences that himself and he sees it in other people and it comes out again and again in his literature. Hamlet is, it comes out in Macbeth a lot and it comes out in a lot of his other plays. Hamlet, though, is the great masterpiece of thought versus action. So let's, let's break this down a little bit. Wanting to do something versus actually doing it, as I said, go ahead, ask out that cute girl. Try it and you'll see how, how painful it can be. More specific to Hamlet himself, he is of high intelligence, and I guess you could argue, and Shakespeare seems to argue, that the higher your intelligence and the more sensitive you are, he also has a sensitive nature, which means he's sensitive to the, to the multiple angles by which a problem should be approached or could be approached. Now, that's great. That, that ability to see all these things and that high intelligence is, is very useful, of course. But look at that, you, you, you know, you probably know yourself that, that overthinking can totally paralyze you. Hamlet is smart and can't help seeing all sides of an issue and that paralyzes him. You'll see it, uh, uh, you know, all throughout the play, he's paralyzed, he can't because he thinks, he says, okay, I'm gonna do this. Wait a minute, what if, what if this is true? It's the great what ifs, you know, these, these constant what if, what if, what if, what ifs, they, 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 they freeze us, they, they, we lose the heat of action. The hand loses the heat of action, as, as he says in uh, Macbeth, I think. Uh, every delay is, in fact, justifiable, justified logically. Hamlet's really good. He's good at talking himself out of action. Uh, and maybe the worst kind of, or the most painful kind of, of uh, the most painful kind of, of rationalizations are the ones that are actually true. And when Hamlet says, yeah, I'm going to kill him, but maybe I shouldn't because of this, is he a coward or is he actually smart? The answer is that he's both. He's, he's using that, that, that truth to, to get him out of doing something that he doesn't really want to do. To act, we must ignore many truths and focus only on one. There are people of action. There are people of action. They don't think, they just act. And that can get them into a lot of trouble, but it can also get a lot of stuff done. Okay, so look, look at it in your own life. Uh, related to that is passive-aggressive cowardice. Hamlet sincerely wants to kill, but he is afraid. He has no problem killing people indirectly. He's very much like Walter White. Uh, in Shakespeare's play, uh, three, three people, uh, uh, maybe, maybe it's four. Uh, anyway, I could think of three. He kills three people. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, he kills, but he does it by signing a letter to have him killed by somebody else. And Polonius, he kills, but he kills him through a curtain. Polonius is on the other side of a curtain and he stabs it so he doesn't have to see the murder, do you see? Now go watch uh, Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad, by the way, is absolutely brilliant. The Sopranos and Breaking Bad, brilliant, 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 brilliant Shakespearean level psychological development. Walter White is a, is a Macbeth character, but he also has a strong element of Hamlet in him. Uh, he, Walter White it, it results, uh, causes the death of many, many people in, in that Breaking Bad series, but I don't think he ever does it directly and even when he kills somebody at the very end of the whole series he actually pulls the trigger it's a it's a weird accident that causes him to, to pull the trigger or something I, I can't remember but anyway it's it's it's, it's a passive aggressive cowardice thing and hamlet does have this and as i said when he comes up with these rationalizations because he's so smart uh he's he's not lying really but he's using that truth to get out of something to get out of doing something that, that he really should do uh he's sensitive when he does kill Polonius, um, he's, we see him, we hear about him weeping over the body of Polonius is, is, is a hateful character. He's a manipulative, total, total, you know, he, he's a total nobody. Um, he, he's, he's, a, he's an odious character. Um, but Hamlet is Hamlet and, and murder is murder. And, and he feels, I, I, think he's, I think he really cries over, over Polonius's body. But there's, there is strong evidence and, and, and I, wouldn't, I, I couldn't completely disagree if you said that no, Hamlet's faking those tears. Um, it, it's, it's quite interesting. But that's the problem with, with Shakespeare. Every time you think that A is true, somebody throws up and says, you know, somebody throws up a B and says, well, what about B? And you say, well, yeah, okay, fine, yeah, all right, fine. Um, Shakespeare, uh, Hamlet is mentally unstable. Uh, there's lots of evidence in this play, and and real psychologists, you know, when when they when they when they teach psychology and and psychoanalytic um, procedures and, and methods in universities, they do use fiction uh, as kind of case studies. And and um, Holden Caulfield is a very much a hand a, a Hamlet character. If you've read Catcher in the Rye, uh, Holden Caulfield and Hamlet are, are almost 
they could be brothers. They could be twins. They're very, very similar characters. Uh, they both have, have they're both they're both very sympathetic characters, but they're both flawed heroes. Um, Holden is maybe more successful than Hamlet. Uh, Hamlet suffers from depression, anxiety, and I would say many personality disorders. Uh, he's narcissistic for sure. We'll talk about that. Uh, histrionic personality disorder. Just take just do a Google images or a Google search for you know, personality disorders, and Hamlet's got probably at least half of them. The same with Holden Caulfield and Catcher in the Rye. And the result of a lot of this, if, if you are suffering uh, moderate to extreme depression and anxiety, decision-making is absolutely brutal. You don't know, you don't know what to do. You're, you're confronted with four different options, and all you, all you can do is panic because because your, your mental state is not stable. So, so when you're in that kind of mental instability, you need your buddies, you need your bras, to, to actually help you make those decisions. Poor Hamlet, as I've mentioned, is alone, is alone except for poor Horatio. He can't, he can't ask his mother for help, he can't ask his girlfriend, he can't ask his father because he's dead. Tragic, tragic, tragic. Okay, so that's thought versus action, the difference between uh, um, thinking about something and wanting to do it and actually doing it, and all of these are connected to that. Um, you probably could argue that existentialism is at the heart of almost all really great philosophical literature like like something like Hamlet or Macbeth. Um, what I mean by this is a simplified version of, of what we what philosophers would call existentialism. It's simply the struggle to find meaning in, and stability in a meaningless, unstable world. Hamlet's great soliloquies uh, are exactly that, uh, the famous to be or not to be soliloquies. He's got four long soliloquies and and three of them, if I'm not mistaken, at least two of them, I think the third one as well, the fourth one is kind of a, a weird, stupid, irritating one, but one of them is, uh, a narcissistic one is that fourth one, but the, at least two of them, and, and maybe the third, if I remember correctly, uh, are dealing with this, to be or not to be, to be alive or to not be alive, to, 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 to suffer all the meaningless, absurd, futile struggles of life is it worth it? It's, a, it's again, it's another grand old question, and his soliloquies are some of the most beautiful poetry um, that deal with those questions. I personally, I love the uh, the tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow soliloquy in Macbeth better. I think that's that's absolutely gorgeous poetry, some of the saddest stuff ever written. But Hamlet soliloquies rank right up there too. Uh, it's the grand. Well, I talked about that. It's the suicide question. Um, it's it's it, it's a good question, you know. Um, Shakespeare's answer. What's his answer? You can you can, you can find Shakespeare's answer in his tragedies, uh, and in and in, in some of them are bleak. And his answer is maybe it's not worth it. But if you go to to the best of Shakespeare's comedies, you find the exact opposite. And interestingly, if you go to Macbeth, you find the opposite as well. Uh, in Macbeth, it ends in misery. And for Macbeth himself. Uh, yeah, the answer is sure, you should have committed suicide because you are a corrupt, uh, um, cynical shell of a human. There's lots of evidence in Macbeth that the people who, who have developed their vitality, a vital spirit vitalizes. Shakespeare makes it very clear in Macbeth that the vital spirit vitalizes and therefore the struggle is worth it, do you see? So it's an interesting question and Shakespeare being such an interesting person, he deals with it in a very interesting way. Another great question is the great question of why do nice guys always finish last? Why is it always the, the jerks that, are, that end up as rulers? The shrewd, cunning, ruthless Claudius types are always winning. Why, why? We shake our fists at the heavens. It's not fair. Um, it's a good question. And Shakespeare's answer very often by the way, in, in a lot of his literature is, yes, that's the way it is, ladies and gentlemen, that the nice guys do finish last, the Claudius types do work, the, if you're the more ruthless and cunning you are, you very often come up on top. Uh, ruthless, uh, uh, Claudius wins, and then another liar and backstabber, Fortinbras wins after, by defeating Claudius. Um, and the kind of good guys, Hamlet is not entirely a good guy, we kind of find him really, really irritating, more irritating even than Romeo, uh, but still, in a much a de much more decent person than someone like Claudius, and maybe more than Fortinbras, um, yeah, he he loses. So it's it's the real real politic means the the really dirty stuff that happens behind closed doors. When we use the word real politic, there's also an implication that perhaps that stuff is actually necessary because in the jungle 
if you're not if you if you don't become a tiger you're going to get eaten by a tiger do you see what i mean so the world is full of tigers and you have to develop those real politic skills in order to deal with the other demons it's a trap right because of the old adage you know be care of be careful of 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 fighting monsters that you don't become one yourself i butchered that one but yeah machiavelli machiavelli he wrote the prince he was the italian um strategist i guess we can call him uh, from from the renaissance and he wrote uh, uh the prince and it was machiavellian advice we use it as an adjective now machiavellian is is that uh, claudius is a machiavellian type he he doesn't he, he he knows what it takes to get on in the world he knows what it takes and he goes for it he says yeah this is how the world works i'm going to play the game Hamlet is the idealist. I'm, in my next video, I'm going to do characterization, and I got a lot of pages to talk about Hamlet. And one of his great traits is that he's an idealist, the exact opposite of, of Claudius. And Hamlet says, Hamlet shakes his fist at the heavens and says, "Why? Why is this the way it is? And I'm not going to play this game." And yet he does. Appearance versus reality is handled more completely in Macbeth. Um, if you've watched my other videos on Macbeth, but it is dealt with here in quite a, in quite a bit of detail. Appearance versus reality. Again, it's it's kind of like existentialism. It's kind of like you know uh, thought versus action and self versus society. They're unavoidable. Uh, look look at your look at your your young adult fiction. Look at anything, and appearance versus reality comes up somehow. What appears to be true and what is really true. What's going on behind closed doors? Of course, that involves hypocrisy. What seems to be the case. What people say versus what they think or how they act okay that that that's a you've, you've seen that again and again and projection is interesting too we see what we expect to see Re remember that phrase remember that phrase it's a good one for your own life and and it's and it's very good for analyzing hamlet as well we see what we want to see we see what we expect to see if you're corrupt you look at the world and you see corruption if you're naive and trusting you look at the world and you trust everything do you see and neither of those polar opposites is very healthy um, we should have a more realistic uh, we don't we shouldn't have to project we should just see the world we try to see the world as, as as realistically as possible Hamlet projects his distorted beliefs on on the world and so there's there's the appearance versus reality he rails against hypocrisy that that's that's as I said before when I was talking about this he, he he's an idealist and the idealist rages against hypocrisy what people say they are and what they really are smiling villain he calls Claudius a smiling villain this next one is really, really interesting and gets to the heart of, 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 of Hamlet's psychological problems, the mind-body duality issue. Um, the West has been split. The West over the centuries has become split. There, there, there's the, the ancient Greeks, even before Christianity, the ancient Greeks talked about this as well. The ancient Greeks personified the upper powers, the mind, the spirit, God. They, they associated that with Apollo so we can call those loosely the, the Apollonian impulses there are, they are our higher faculties okay your, your your spiritual side your intellectual side those things are good they're high they're pure they're moral learning intellect art science etc um, we, we try to live in there we try to live here as much as possible we do but we can't deny the lower powers, and the lower powers were uh, uh, were personified by the ancient Greeks by the god Bacchus, uh, Bacchus and Dio Dionysus Bacchus, the, the, the god of wine, the god of craziness, the god of revels, the god of music and partying and that kind of stuff, uh, and and sexuality as well. It's the beast in us. Uh, the beast is the satyr. The satyr is the 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 pan, the the half goat. He's the half goat. He's got the horns and he's got the the goat's legs. Um, just Google Sater and get Google image Sater and you'll see them. You probably know them. Uh, they represent the lower powers and the lower powers are lower powers. They're powers. They're, they're part of the forces of nature. They involve the, the body. They involve sexuality. They involve losing your mind in, 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 in action, 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 warfare. If we're, if we're more primitive uh, culture or um, raves. You know, if we're a more primitive culture, it's the same kind of thing. Well, those two, the, the Greeks understood that those two forces have to be balanced. If you're too much of one, you're, 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 you're in trouble. If you're too much of the other, you're in trouble. If you're too much mind, this is, shake, this, is, this, is, this is Hamlet's problem. Hamlet tries to cut a line off his neck. He tries to live purely in the Apollonian realm. He, 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 he is arrogant. He's arrogant and he's narcissistic. He idolizes his father. He, calls his, he, 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 he compares his father to Apollo. He actually says directly, you know, like Apollo, whatever. 
He associates, he associates everything good with the higher powers. He's revolted by the lower powers. He's revolted by drinking. He makes fun of Claudius, and he doesn't make fun. He laments Claudius's indulgence in wine. He's kind of a Puritan. Hamlet's a bit of a Puritan, and I think Shakespeare, in Shakespeare's time, the Puritans had tremendous power, and they gave the, uh, the, 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 the traveling players, the traveling actors, a really, really hard time in Shakespearean times because the, the, the actors were considered low. They were considered almost as, on the same level as prostitutes, if not the same level. So there, there's a, but, ha, but Shakespeare understood, like the Greeks understood, that we have to balance these two forces. Live in the Apollonian realm, of course, during the day. At night, relax a little, have a little fun. Sex is not a bad thing. Partying a bit is not a bad thing, okay? It, it's, but but if, if you are this Puritan, the extreme Christian view is, is that the body, the earth, is part of Satan's realm. The mind and the spirit are God's realm, and we have to live up here and deny that these exist. Well, try living like that for a while, and you're going to have a schizophrenic crack-up, which is exactly what happens to poor Hamlet. His puritanical side takes over and causes him a lot of problems. That lower, the Dionysian forces are the physical life, drinking, sex, money, worldly matters. This is where Claudius exists, and Hamlet actually calls Claudius this half-goat a half goat, an animal. He associates Claudius's desires. Claudius is having sex with his mother. Ew. Really, really ew. Claudius drinks a lot, you know? So, so Hamlet's a bit of a prig. He, he's a bit of an unlikable prig. He really is. He, he, he denies this too much. He, doesn't, he hasn't balanced those forces within him, and they're very important. Failure to integrate and accept both forces equals neurosis if not schizophrenia, it, seriously, it, it, it's a really big problem. The Greeks understood this, like the Greeks understood everything before everybody else. If you read, uh, get a book called The Tales from Ovid by Ted Hughes, it's fantastic, and read the short story. They're, they're, they're stories told in poetic form, but they're easy to read. Uh, Bacchus and Pentheus. Pentheus was an Apollonian king. He tried to live in the Apollonian realm like Hamlet. He says, no, my city is a pure, high, morally good city. And he hears news of Bacchus approaching the city and says, we're not going to, we're going to keep that, that whore out of my town. And you read the story and you'll find out what happens to poor old Pentheus. Uh, he has a crack up all right. Anyway, this is a big part of Hamlet, really big. And I find it one of the most interesting parts of Hamlet. So the Oedipal Complex, we talked about a little bit already. It actually comes from the ancient Greeks. There was a play written called Oedipus Rex, uh, Oedipus the King, and Oedipus ends up inadvertently killing his own father and inadvertently marrying his own mother and having kids by her. So Sigmund Freud, uh, the great, one of the first psychologists who tried to scientize psychology, Shakespeare and the ancient Greeks, you know, they had psychology. They understood it deeply, 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 but Sigmund Freud tried to make it into a science. And he looked at the Oedipus story and he recognized that, you know what, maybe there is a subconscious desire of all sons to kill their fathers and marry their mothers because the mothers are the first love interest of, of the baby boy or girl. It can work with a girl too, but there's a, a bit of a different dynamic going on here. So we'll stick to the Hamlet male version. Uh, the, first love, the first love interest, the first romance is the, is the child, the boy child on the, the mother's breast. That's what it is. And then all of a sudden, as the boy gets older, he recognizes that there's this other hairy, big male creature that's competing with him for the mother's attention. So there's that, that rivalry that goes on. Now, we don't want to belabor that point too much, but the way I use it, the way I understand it in, in Hamlet's situation is what I mentioned earlier in this video. It's, it's the consuming mother who doesn't want the child to grow up and to leave her. So she, she projects and by, and so she's projecting onto the boy, this, uh, these, these unhealthy desires. So the boy gets wrapped up uh, in this, there's another word for it, it's uh, enmeshment or something like that. They get, they get wrapped up in this unhealthy dynamic. Um, and the boy metaphorically or symbolically has been married to the mother, like in the Joker. I think the Joker character has been metaphorically married to the mother in a very, very unhealthy way. Um, it, now, we shouldn't blame the mother entirely. Uh, very often that's the case, but th maybe th there's a failure of the child to grow up and away from the parents as well. That can sometimes happen uh, because of the, the faults, the innate faults of, of the boy, probably most often caused by the parents. Anyway, Hamlet has that in relation to his mother. We see it in, as I mentioned, in that, in that, uh, that weird bedroom scene. He, he's, as, Hamlet is sexually repressed, as I just talked about, and his, his, he can't 
accept the fact that the mother is a sexually active creature and she's sleeping with his uncle, with Claudius. It completely disturbs him. Rightfully so, I suppose. Again, everything in Shakespeare is always, yeah, okay, fine, that's actually true, but there's something else going on here. The way Hamlet handles it and the extreme to the, the extremes to which he goes to forbid his mother from having lustful thoughts is weird. It it really is. There's something off about it and not healthy, suggesting that he is at some deep level um, projecting onto his mother unhealthy uh, um, erotic uh, feelings. Strange. This last one, finally, theme 11, is projection, which we've already talked about, so we'll go fairly quickly through it. We don't see the world as it truly is. We see the, what we want to see. Now, now keep, keep that. This is what great literature does for us. It, it gives us these little, these little kernels of unbelievably wise observations about ourselves. It's not about Hamlet. This play isn't about Hamlet. It's about you. It's about different aspects of you to, a ver to varying degrees, okay? So we see what we want to see. We see what we expect to see. Remember that. Remember that when you're reading other stuff. And, and remember that when you're living your own life. And you, you'll recognize how wise the statement is when you, make, when you find yourself doing stupid stuff. Claudius sees treachery because he's treacherous. Um, Polonius sees duplicity because he's duplicitous. And Hamlet, more importantly, he sees shameful lustfulness in his mother and in Ophelia. He rails at those two people, not because they are shamefully lustful, but because he hasn't dealt with his own sexuality. And so he, that becomes an obsession for him. And when something becomes obsessed in our mind, we see it everywhere. It's projection. It's like a projector. There's a, there's a, there's a projecting camera, not, not a camera, but the projector in our foreheads, and we're projecting it onto everything we see. I can't deal with my sexuality, so I look at you and I see that you must be sexually corrupt in some way because that's all I can see in everybody else. Um, you do it. You, you do not, not with the sexual thing necessarily, but you, you do it in different ways. I do it too. We see what we want to see. We see what we expect to see in others. So projection, think about that. When you're having a fight with your, with your friends, your boyfriends, your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, give yourself a check. Give yourself a Shakespeare check and make sure you're not projecting. Okay, that was five quote Shakespeare Hamlet theme analysis. Come back for my next video when we analyze character. Thanks for watching.